Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Find more episodes and subscribe on your favorite platforms. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com. In this episode of Writing Matters, I speak with Dr. Marcel Haddix and Shauna Coppola. Both are educators and authors. Shauna has worked with the Educator Collaborative and offers a variety of programs through the University of New Hampshire, and in addition is the author of two books for Stenhouse. Marcel Haddix is the Dean's Professor and Chair of the Reading and Language Arts Department at Syracuse University School of Education, where she is also the inaugural co-director of the Lender Center for Social Justice and is the president of the Literacy Research Association. This is the 10 year anniversary of her Writing Our Lives project, and she is also the author of an award-winning book, Cultivating Racial and Linguistic Diversity in Literacy Teacher Education, Teachers Like Me. Our conversation ranges through a variety of topics related to the teaching of writing, to parenting, and what it means to lead the life of a teacher writer. Welcome to Writing Matters. Today, I get to speak with two people that I met first in June of 2018 at a literacy conference in Wisconsin and have since been able to engage in some really wonderful collaborative dialogue through a variety of different ways. I'm so happy today to have Shauna Coppola and Marcel Haddix. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm really curious to hear from each of you just a little bit about the path that you've taken um, through your educational journey to where you're at today. And then I know you've got a great deal of collaborative work and some projects and um, an NCTE panel coming up. And so we'll get into that pretty quickly. But maybe each of you could take just a moment to tell us a little bit about who you are as an educator and, and what your work looks like right now. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, I, I, um, it's funny, you mentioned that we met in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is my hometown or home state. Um, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so that was a really um, a special moment for me to um, be back in Wisconsin and talking to teachers. It felt like a full circle moment. Um, you know, I come from educators and, you know, teaching was something I think, you know, growing up, I thought it was a path that I would be able to escape. But the folks in my family, um, you know, are educators, they're community organizers, um, they're activists, um, they're youth advocates. And so, um, as I say, the, uh, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. So I, um, growing up in Wisconsin and Milwaukee, um, that was very much a part of my upbringing. And I always loved reading, you know, and writing. Um, Literacy was an escape for me, um, you know, in in, in reading books and finding authors um, who told stories, who um, helped me to imagine possibilities and to travel um, via the word. Um, I always, I was inspired by that and I always wanted to be a writer. Um, I love dealing with literature and with text and with words. I love language. And as I thought about becoming a teacher, um, that was just a natural progression for me to want to offer that same um, opportunity and pathway for other young people um, like myself uh, to to really fall in love with with the word and with language and feel like they had an an outlet for sharing their stories and their experiences. Um, So, you know, I'm trained as an English teacher, um, also taught composition at the college level. So writing um, and composition has always been near and dear and eventually, you know, moved into becoming a teacher educator and working at the university level to train other teachers. And my own research and scholarship um, has focused over the years on creating spaces for um, both teachers and students to write their lives, both within and beyond school context. 
Um, and that's kind of gotten me to where I am today. I'm sure we'll dive into this a little bit in the conversation, but I, this is the, as I was thinking about this um, conversation, this is the 10 year anniversary for one of the projects that I started here. I'm in Syracuse, um, New York, uh, called Writing Our Lives. And um, I just appreciate the opportunity to be able to reflect on what uh, that experience working with youth writers, teachers, writing um, writers and authors and other creative folks in the Syracuse community um, to create opportunities for and support opportunities for young people to write their lives. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I would like to hear more about the intersection of writing our lives as well as your other passions with yoga and also with yeah. the new uh, Center for Social Justice that you yes, co-direct. Yeah, so yeah. thank you. And Shauna, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, it, it was so, I love listening to um, how Marcel describes um, her journey into this work and in particular teaching and writing and, and working with the word. Um, I did not come from teachers, but I did come from a really um, a house that was really full uh, in in many ways, metaphorically, but also literally, um, of books and reading and just loving to learn. I can remember really clearly my mom sort of sitting <laughs> in her chair in the living room on a Saturday or Sunday morning, and she sometimes would read the dictionary, <laughs> which I thought was kind of odd as a child, but um, she just loved learning, and she always had books, and I remember just, you know, going through her bookshelf and, and, you know, um, using my finger to kind of trace the spines. Um, and as a child, I was, I was quite shy. I still am very shy in many ways. And so for me, stories were really also an escape, but um, a way where I felt um, I didn't feel small, because um, I really felt small in the world because I was so scared to kind of really, um, you know, talk to people and even look at people. And, um, but when I, when I began teaching, I think I came to it more because I was good at school. I was good at doing school. And I thought, well, this is something I'm good at. Maybe this is something I should pursue. Um, but what I, what I really started thinking about when I first started teaching was, how much of, a, of an honor it is to really have children know that there's somebody who, um, in the school space who, who just loves them. Um, and in particular, middle school students, I started teaching middle school, and I just remember feeling so lost at that age and um, so awkward and, and just not enough. And one of my favorite things about being an educator is, is really showing children and adolescents that, that they really are enough through my actions and my words, and my behaviors, and how I um, show curiosity about their lives. Um, so that's sort of where, where my um, joy really comes from with education. Right now, I, I spent most of my professional life um, working in children in grades K to 8 with a focus on both literacy and inquiry. Um, but right now, I'm traveling across the country um, doing more facilitation of professional learning for teachers. Um, and I also volunteer teach at a self-directed learning community for children ages 11 to 18. So I still am connected to children, but um, it's been tough not being connected in, in ways that I have been in the past. So I do miss building those really long lasting relationships, but I'm able to get a little bit of a fix with the work that I do at this, at this learning community. It, it's certainly amazing to hear from both of you. And I know that in my own work, sometimes I feel that I say I'm not in the classroom every day and yet I still honor and respect the voices of teachers and try to come to the work. And I, and I hear that level of humility and that genuine appreciation for what teachers do uh, from both of you. And I also appreciate that you're both willing to share stories of your own families and children and lives in your writing. And 
maybe you could talk a little bit about that, but certainly we want to hear about your collaborations and, and upcoming um, discussions that will be happening at NCTE, but maybe you could just talk for a few moments about the role of family and children and the ways in which you see your own, um, the embodiment of literacy learning uh, through your own parenting and, and what that means for the two of you. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I know for me and I, you know, I talk about this a lot with folks. I um, am now a parent of an 18 year old, which is mind boggling for me, but um, he just navigating his educational experiences. Um, that is, that's, that's my starting point often these days when I think about the education that I imagine for all young folks. Um, I think about what I desire for my own um, child, who's now a young black man growing up in America, and what his schooling experiences have been like, um, and spaces where he has not always feel, felt welcome, um, where there have been assumptions made about his abilities um, or his interests. And so how to create spaces um, and honor those spaces where young folks just like him um, feel where they can be their full and whole selves um, in the classroom. And I think Shauna, what, what you mentioned um, about, you know, just wanting, going into teaching so that, you know, kids feel like they're people when they go to school that love on them, that, that want them to, to feel safe, to feel like they can learn and, and really enjoy learning. Um, that's what I've always wanted for my own child um, as a parent. And so when I first moved to Syracuse, he was, uh, we've been here 11 years now, he was going into first grade. And so, um, you know, we were, we were challenged with the educational opportunities for him. And, you know, I, my, what I know to do is immediately get involved with community work and to find out what other parents and folks were doing. And that's largely where writing our lives and some of the out of school projects that I've coordinated over the years, that's where they started. Um, from me just seeking connection with other parents, navigating the school terrain here in Syracuse to think about what we needed to do to advocate for our kids in school, but then also what are the ways that we can support and honor their learning and their gifts and their skills um, within and beyond school. And so that was where writing our lives came from. And now, you know, um, you know, especially working with college students, college age student and students and having one in my home, um, I see how important writing is in his life and in the interest that he's always loved comics. Now he's really into music and writing music lyrics. Um, it's just a natural part of who he is. And so I see the power of when you, you know, create those opportunities and spaces and cultivate spaces for young folks to really, um, you know, one, see themselves as writers, to see themselves as, um, you know, take on that, being able to take on that identity um, as writers and to have opportunities in school where they can practice writing and share their writing. So I think that's really um, been just an important part of, of our family life. Um, and I mean, that's a good thing, but it, it you know, it, it always, for me, it starts, starts at home. It starts with self, it starts with family um, and community. And that, that is where, why I have such deep commitments to the work that I do. Yeah, I, I remember when I heard you first talk, Mark Fell in Wisconsin, and one of the things that you said that really spoke to me was this this warning of, or almost in a sense, that so much of our language around children's literacies in school are, are from, the, from a deficit perspective. And that's what I have found as well. Um, you know, there's just so much language around what kids can't do or what they don't, what, they, what they're not doing, what they're struggling with. Whereas I want to honor what they can do. And when I heard you speak, I, you know, it just brought back all of these 
um, thoughts from when I first began at this, the last school I was at, I was at for seven years as a literacy specialist in a K to six school. And one of the things my um, administrator, uh, who's an amazing educator, her name's um, Kate Lucas, and she and I really wanted to, we were so, it was so hard to hear people um, say, these kids can't. And, and that wasn't the case for every teacher we worked with, but certainly in most schools that I've worked with, that, that has come out um, in one way or another. And for, I don't know what it is, but what I just see that kids can do is so bright and it, sh it shines so brightly that I really wanted to bring that sort of lens and perspective to my colleagues because I just think it changes everything for you as a teacher. Um, and so that's, that's just, that's what I'd want for my own children. Um, and so that's where sort of my work takes place is, is looking at the beauty in what, in what children can do in particular as writers, but as learners all around. Um, and all of the beautiful literacies that are, that they often engage in outside of school spaces, but when they get into many, many school spaces, sort of the dominant ideas around literacy tend to be very, very limiting. And I find that in terms of identity, if we want children to feel that they can write and to identify as writers, um, we need to be more cognizant about bridging those out of school and in school literacies. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I mean, that was largely why, you know, when, when Philip was experiencing um, the education that my, the, the school based literacy and writing was so uh, test driven um, mm -hmm. and an assessment in a way that it's assessment um, that really wasn't looking at student learning um, and informing teacher practice, you know, it was more of a high stakes kind of, you know, uh, assessment. That was when we decided that, you know, homeschooling was gonna be um, a necessary move for us. And that allowed us to really, you know, um, implement a literacy curriculum and a writing curriculum that really centered the student, you know, centered their writing and interests first, mm -hmm. their identity first, um, and then allowing for, you know, supporting more skill uh, development over time. Um, but that wasn't what we were experiencing in school. So when you have those, those experiences as a family and for your own child, you know, for me, that, that has largely motivated um, the work that I do in professional development. So like Troy, like you said, I love to tear, tell stories. Um, I hope that my son doesn't, um, or forgives me later in life for all the stories <laughs> that I've told or I've written about. Right. Um, but, you know, it just shows that these, we, it's very, it's deeply personal, you know, why we teach the way we teach and what we teach. Absolutely. I, I'm thinking back to um, what you said about, I, I hope my son forgives me. I feel the same about my two daughters because my first book that I wrote, which is all about sort of rethinking or revising our literacy practices to make them more student-centered and authentic, really came from a deep place as a parent. Um, and in my introduction, I, it's really a story, uh, this really, really personal story about my partner and I and how we came to understand how important it is to see each child, each child's own individual strengths and build off of those and, and how that informs my work as a teacher. And, and I remember, I mean, I still sort of think about, oh man, when they're older, are they going to be, <laughs> going to be yeah. so mad at me? But I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we'll see. But. Yeah. No, I don't think it's a problem at all. I mean, one of the things as I was preparing to talk with both of you is that I was looking at that opening of your book, Shauna, and then Marcel looking at the, the story um, that you shared in chapter two of cultivating 
racial and linguistic diversity and thinking about how you both look at these experiences with your own child through these literacy lenses and, and then to expand that critical literacies and social justice and all these other types of lenses that come to bear. So uh, at risk of oversimplifying, but also to really speak to an audience of teachers, uh, what are the ways in which even if we're working with 75 or 100 or 120 kids, what are the ways in which we can uh, help keep these writers at the center and to honor their voices and to bring some of their stories into the, the work that we are often mandated and yet still have to some degree some flexibility in our classroom? How can we bring these types of practices into language arts instruction? Marcel, do you want me to? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things that, that I have been presenting on that I wrote about for my second book that's coming out is this idea, and it's not a new idea, but certainly um, that there are so many literacies that, that children are bringing to us that they engage in outside of school spaces. And so when we think about when we think about why we write um, as human beings, all the different reasons why we write, um, they really boil down to um, looking at um, all these reasons that serve the self. You know, so we might write to discover, we write to think, we write to, to tell our story, but also in service to the world. So we might write to, you know, make others laugh or think or um, to inform them about something or to speak out against something. Um, and I think for, I know that for, for far too long in school spaces, our ideas of what kinds of writing counts in school has been far too limited. Um, but what's interesting is that even if we are um, tied to a certain set of standards or a certain writing program, very few of them actually talk about um, or explicitly talk about writing in terms of words on paper or words on screen. It's really about the kinds of decisions that writers make um, as they're composing something. And so one of the ways that I think we can sort of bridge that gap and honor um, the kinds of uh, compositional practices that students bring is to sort of broaden our idea about what kinds of writing is privileged in school spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, that's, I think that's a way to, you know, honor the, the, um, the um, funds of knowledge that children bring to school, a way to honor their, their very real interests, um, a way to honor the skills that they use outside of school spaces when they're engaging in literacies like TikTok or they're engaging in making memes or they're um, engaging in spoken word poetry slams um, and bringing some of those kinds of um, compositional forms and modes into the classroom. Yeah, I, you know, I think that is so important. I feel like teachers and students need to, um, you know, start from a place of understanding that writing is everywhere. You know, like mm -hmm. I've often with, with young folks, like you want to just have conversations with them to think about, you know, just in their everyday lives, you know, you're watching a television program, someone wrote that script or someone wrote the directions for the setting. I mean, all the different ways that writing plays a part in our everyday lives and to make writing more visible in that way. And so I think just Shauna to add to what you're saying, it's for schools to um, have curricula where different forms of writing, different genres, writing for different audiences, like all of those things become a part of how we're defining writing. Because I think at one point, we just saw this shift where everything was just personal writing, where it's like, okay, just, you know, open your journal and write how you feel. That's really important. But when we really take a, a full assessment of young people and how they're writing every day, what they're seeing, how they're composing, how they're creating, 
um, I feel like we, we limit ourselves in the possibilities for the right, the t kinds of writing that can take place in a school, in a school setting. So I think that's just really important just to, um, you know, one way I think is just to really think about the different um, kinds of writing, writing for different purposes, um, and just making writing more visible, the type of writing practices that happen in our everyday lives. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> Yes, and I imagine that the two of you are going to be talking a little bit more about this um, upcoming at NCTE this fall, I believe. That that is that's what our that's essentially what our um, panel is going to be about. I'm going to sort of position it in a broad sense, and then I um, we're going to be there's going to be uh, three of us, so two other people, um, one one someone else besides um, Marcel and I, um, Jennifer Connolly, and um, so I'll sort of put this broad idea out there, but then really the point is to highlight the wonderful work that both Marcel and Jennifer are doing and how this might look in, in different spaces. So that, that is coming yeah. up at NCT. And, you know, one of the things I remember when, you know, you were first um, introduced the proposal to me and just conceptualizing what the session would be about. One of the challenges often um, when you talk about out of spaces is, um, the resistance that me in that, well, that, that lesson or that strategy that can work because you're not, um, bound to all of these other factors or, you know, mm -hmm. um, things that you might have to deal with in a set. And so how to one, just create a space for teachers and teaching professionals for all of us to have a conversation about, you know, naming those fears or, you know, the, the motivating um, so that we can talk about it. Um, I think that is a really, that's going to be a really important part of this session and the opportunity for us to really engage in some writing and modeling with teachers. Cause a lot of it too is, um, you know, my, my first thing always is that teachers, we also have to, um, cultivate our own writing practices and writing identities um, to be a teacher of writing. And so, you know, oftentimes you'll go to conferences like NCTE, which are great, and you'll talk about, um, you know, you'll talk about whatever the content is, but we don't actually get opportunities to engage with and to be creative and to do some writing. So we're hoping that we'll have an opportunity for that as well. Yes, absolutely. And, and also, like you said, create not only creating a space for naming those fears and those real kinds of limits that teachers have in their everyday work lives, but also what's some language that we can offer to help advocate for this work beyond this session. I think that's super important as well. So yeah, that, that's going to be a really important part of the panel. Oh, I definitely want to hear more about the impact that writing has on both of your lives, but I'm wondering if you <laughs> might even give just a quick preview there, because I think that what you just said is so important that on the one hand, yes, teachers do feel constrained by standards, by assessment, by parental expectations, by administrator expectations, by collegial expectations, by their own sense of what quote unquote should happen in an ELA classroom. And yet they, they want to break free of that mold, but they don't know how. So without giving away everything on your panel, <laughs> what, 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 what is one uh, turn of phrase or way that you help teachers make that shift and, and adopt some new language or perspective when they're thinking about um, high quality writing instruction? Well, I think one of the things that I um, wrote about for this book that um, that sort of generated this idea for this panel is um, if we think about all the kinds of decisions that that writers make when whenever they're writing really any kind of form but if we take a specific form like a personal narrative which is so ubiquitous right in school spaces <laughs> the personal narrative um, on paper or on screen um, which is wonderful and I write a lot through that sort of form but um, 
if we think about all the kinds of decisions that writers make, um, this, with very, very few exceptions, they're the same kinds of decisions that someone might make when, say, um, creating a, um, a video or a photo essay. They're, they're all, with the exception of just that, that idea around words or the, the amount of words on a page or on a screen, all those decisions are pretty much the same. There's decisions around audience, decisions around your purpose, what content you're going to include, um, how you're going to set it up, the, the organization and, and the craft that you're going to use, the craft moves, even your motor planning. You know, there's all those kinds of types of decisions are exactly the same. It just, what differs is the kinds of text that you might be creating. Um, so I think kind of making that visible will be a, will go a long way toward helping educators sort of understand the parallels between writing more dominant forms of, of com compositions that we see in, in school spaces and writing some of the ones that would more likely bridge um, students in school literacies with their out of school literacies. Well, and I, I also think too, um, I really, I really agree with that. I'm looking forward to our discussion in November. Um, you know, when I think about writers' identities and, you know, you all know I talk a lot about just the deficit ways in which mm -hmm. young folks are often framed in school policies and um, practices. Uh, you know, for me, thinking about teacher leaders and how they can advocate to, to make changes um, in the school context for young folks is the language is important and and using the language of you know they are writers not just that they have to learn how to write but if you when you begin to frame them and their identity as they are writers they are readers they are scientists they are so then it's we got to create space and time in our school day and in our school curriculum for writers to do what writers do. Um, and so I think there's also a collective identity shifting that, you know, that teachers can lead that um, in their school settings to create that we're not just teaching young folks how to write, but we're actually writing with writers. That that, that begins to shape, to change the, the culture and the environment within schools. Yeah, I agree with you, Marcel, and I think that's so important because, you know, some people might say, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just saying something that, but, but truly language matters. And I saw that that kind of work actually led to just really wonderful learning for everybody in my own, the last school where I was at, when we started sort of, I mean, we didn't, we didn't say don't ever say or don't, or let's ban this, but we would start every staff meeting with what what can children do that you'd like to celebrate and the more we use that language um and another thing we did was um i would be in a couple of uh, certain classrooms and my uh co-teacher because i did a lot of co-teaching and i had one in particular and she would say okay writers here's what we're going to do next or okay okay, mathematicians, and that really changed the culture. So I totally agree with you. I think it's a great point. Well, I thank you both for sharing those insights and even just reminding us throughout and here right at the end about this importance of language and the way that we describe what it is we do, but then actually enact that and share that language and process with our students. So as we come here to a close, and I'm so sorry, I'm not going to be at NCTE this fall to hear your oh, flip no. panel conversation. <laughs> so I got a little preview here and, and <laughs> listeners of the podcast who may not be at NCTE will get some of your gifts as well. So thank you. I'm really curious to hear for both of you. Uh, you've described so much about how writing is important in your lives, but if you had to encapsulate it and, and to really sum it up, uh, what is the kind of impact that writing has for each of you in your lives? And, and how would you describe yourselves as teacher writers? 
<laughs> um, it's funny. I had to I chuckle because I've been having this conversation um, today, actually, because in the last um, year or so, I've taken on more leadership and administrative responsibilities in my professional life. Um, and, you know, currently I'm not teaching a class um, because I'm, you know, chairing a department, I'm running a center for social justice, um, you know, I'm president of a national organization. So I have a number of um, leadership and administrative responsibilities that don't allow me to, to have the writerly life that I've had in the past. And it really is a struggle and a challenge for me mm -hmm. um, to not have the flexibility that I've had in the past to write. Um, you know, as academics, it's what, that's the joy. It's one of the privileges, the great gifts of the, the profession is that you have those opportunities. No matter how hard or challenged writing can be, you have that freedom to be able to do it. And um, I don't take that for granted. And so I'm really feeling it right now. It's like, you know, I had a student that, um, actually now I met him as a high schooler now he's a doctoral student in my program studying with me um, and I always remember his quote that he needed writing to breathe that writing to him was like breathing and I, I fully understand that um, and so I think about that too when I work with you know practicing and developing teachers that you know if you 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 have to interrogate and reflect on your own relationship to writing um, before you can really begin to do work with youth writers. You have to think about what it means for you. And for me, it's a very physical and visceral, you know, uh, and an emotional feeling that I have a connection to it. Um, it's like you had mentioned, Troy, my yoga practice. I practice yoga every day. I know what it feels like when I don't practice it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same with writing. You know, when I, I had an opportunity last week to introduce Jessamyn Ward, one of my favorite writers and authors right now, and writing the introduction, it was like breathing. So I just, I look for those opportunities to, you know, put my words and my thoughts on paper. And um, I don't take for granted the necessity and the importance to offer that for young people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny that you, you used, um, you mentioned that quote from that student because I actually have your voices in the middle piece up here on my screen right now and I'm looking right at that part where you talk about yeah. uh, that student and how he said, for me, writing is like breathing, I need it to survive. Um, I, I feel like if I couldn't compose, I couldn't live a happy and fulfilling life. And um, and that's not hyperbole. It really truly is. Um, I think one of the, my biggest coping mechanisms <laughs> in life is through humor. And if I couldn't express myself um, in a way that, that sort of gets at my inner anxieties and fears and, and turns it into something that's kind of funny to some people, maybe annoying to others. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure I'd be as functional as I am, to be quite honest. And so I, I do a lot of my writing through, through comic writing um, and through micro writing, um, just little bits and pieces here and there. Um, and if I'm not involved in a big project like a, a book or a blog series or even just, you know, I've done some manuscript review work where I'm writing, you know, my review and just that kind of really deep sort of thinking slash writing, um, then I have to be in school in some way so that I'm, I'm doing it somewhere else. So um, it really is for me um, a necessity. Yes. Well, that certainly resonates for me as well in, in hearing these kind of metaphors and analogies to breathing and living and interrogating and just thinking about the ways that writing plays a role in our lives and what you are then both able to do in bringing the voices of exceptional students um, into that and helping teachers see 
many different ways to work with uh, students and, and invite them to be writers, not just to say, okay, we are going to write, but as you, you mentioned a moment ago, that they're going to be writers and lead a writer's life, I think is so incredibly important. I thank both of you for the work that you do with and for uh, students, with and for teachers, and appreciate your time uh, being our guest today. Thank you, Troy. Yes. Thank you. And it was so nice to be able to, um, to talk with Marcel too, even though we're not in the same room, it's still so great to hear um, both of you. So thank you for, for putting this together. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Discover more episodes and subscribe on your favorite streaming platforms or check out filmed episodes on YouTube. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com.